Wonder if we'll get a good quote out of Hayden Donnell tonight. It is Wednesday, of course. It means time now for Midweek Media Watch. And Hayden is here. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mark. Nice to be here again. And nice to have you here. It's good to have some company. You wanted to start off with a brief update on an earlier Media Watch story about Wellington Mayor Tori Fano. Yes, a couple of weeks ago on the main Media Watch show, Colin reported on some stories about the Mayor's drunken night out at a Central Wellington bar. And these stories all made mention of some footage supposedly circulating online of this night out. So just as an example, here's how RNZ introduced its report on Checkpoint. Wellington Mayor Tori Fano has admitted to more drunken antics in a central city bar. She has confirmed to RNZ that she has a drinking problem after multiple council sources, including supporters of the mayor, told RNZ about footage showing her in an intoxicated state. Now, as you heard there, the mayor did confess to being drunk, but I will clarify, she didn't admit to any of what RNZ described as antics. More than that, though, neither she, or it turns out anyone at RNZ, had seen the footage. In fact, it doesn't seem like anyone has seen the footage. I think Joel McManus in the spin-off wrote about this, how everyone that talked about this footage pointed to another place, whether you're on Discord, you point to Reddit, on Reddit, you point to TikTok, on TikTok, you point to Twitter slash X, and no one had actually seen it. And obviously that didn't stop RNZ and others reporting on it. So in an accompanying article, RNZ went further. It said it had learned of this footage. I don't know Hmm. how you learn of something that you haven't seen in such a definite way. The Post as well noted rumours of this footage circulating. On the platform, Sean Plunkett, he actually went the farthest, uh, possibly unsurprisingly, he spelled out in lurid detail what this alleged footage contains in a monologue that I, in my unprofessional legal opinion, seemed to contain a lot of potentially defamatory stuff if it's not true. And last time I checked, that monologue was behind a paywall. But maybe maybe that's just because I've been accessing too much platform content over the last few few months or weeks. Have you survived that? Um, <laughs> none of the, the people or organisations obviously have seen the footage, personally. Is there any proof it actually exists? None so far, Mark. It's now been four weeks since Fano was at Havana Bar, two weeks since the first reporting emerged, And I'm wondering where this footage that our media organisations learned of might be. And I don't want to get conspiratorial here, Mark, you know me, but (laughs) could it possibly be that it doesn't actually exist? (gasps) No. That it's somehow a concoction of online rumour amplified and reinforced in the fevered realms of delusion and prejudice which exist in places like Telegram or under the loving gaze of Elon Musk on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. Could it be that the media has been taken in by what amounts to a digital chain letter passed on by people with an axe to grind. I don't know. I'm just asking questions (laughs) here. But time will tell. And uh, if that is the case, it wouldn't be the first time. Back in 2018, the police had to put out a statement saying Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's partner, Clark Gayford, wasn't under investigation and had never been charged with a crime after online rumours about him spread like wildfire and started making their way into the mainstream media. And in that case, some news organisations got legal letters, but I'm not sure whether a similar situation will arise in this case. Obviously, Tori Fano has admitted at least to being drunk in a bar. Uh, But as I understand it, at least one media council complaint has been lodged with RNZ over its reporting. So, now, is this a lesson in the saga, you know, for our news outlets, do you think? I think so. It just goes to show that even if, I mean, I, I, I really highly doubt this will happen, but even if this footage does emerge, I think it shows, emerges, then I think it does show the dangers of reporting just based on rumour, even rep- rumour that's been passed on through a trusted intermediary, a supporter of the mayor that wouldn't appear to have a motive for doing so, because... Social media, this new age of social media, it does have a way of just producing a lot of smoke even when there's not fire. There's Mm. just so many tweets that amplify tweets, that amplify posts, that amplify Mm. various things. And a lot of the time in the past, if there was that much smoke, you'd just say there has to be a fire. But now there can be a lot of smoke and there's no fire. So unless you have incontrovertible evidence that the flames exist, it might be best to stay away from reporting them. 
if it did exist, you'd think it would have been seen. Someone would have put it up. Well, you'd think exist. it would be out by now. Yeah. Now, the AUT uh, media ownership report came out this week, uh, the Auckland University of Technology. You'd, you'd like to pick up on a few highlights in that? Yes, I would. Every year, AUT puts out one of these reports assessing the state of the local media market. And I, this kind of reminded me, I just, uh, can I divert for a second? Because the same people that put out this report put out another one about trust in news. Mm. And I've been meaning to ask, one of the things in that report was that we in New Zealand, I think are the, the we tune out the news the most in the world. We, we actively avoid the news more than any other country in the world. And we're less interested in the news than any other country in the world. And I wondered, just in the, in the name of listener engagement, mm -hmm. uh, whether any of our listeners have been suffering from news fatigue. Mm. Do you ever just actively avoid the news, Mark? Um, not, not often, no, I have to say. Um, I mean, I, I enjoyed the post-election uh, period when there wasn't much politics. It was, it was lovely. It was I'm, I'm the media watch guy. I should be <laughs> saying this. But I found it interesting. One of the things that people said that they made them avoid the news the most was the negativity mm -hmm. that's got yeah. them down. And probably after COVID, that was particularly acute i wondered whether i wouldn't i wouldn't re, i would never religiously watch the six o'clock news which used to be the the standard wasn't it you'd you'd sit and watch that to get your gathering of news but i, I guess because i'm in the industry i'm hearing the news all the day anyway yeah and if i'm on twitter so i'm just getting yeah. it all the time no matter what i mean are you suffering news fatigue text 2101 anyway i'll go <laughs> on to this one please do <laughs> the ownership structures of our local media this report says this recent one about ownership they're largely static from years past with a mix of these mid-level shareholder private equity owned corporations smaller private independent companies, crown-owned broadcasters making up the lion's share of the market. And the global context, it's a bit different. There's been a bunch of media mega mergers, meaning outlets are increasingly concentrated in the hands of big corporations like Comcast and Fox. And the the, the report, there's an introduction in it from Wayne Hope, one of the people at AUT, and he kind of asks whether we have a free media when a handful of giant corporations like Amazon, for instance, own our newspapers, TV channels, radio stations, social media, and streaming services. That's... Mm. That's a big question, mm -hmm. probably not one that we're going to fully answer tonight. But it is worth noting, just in the local context, that one of those giants, Warner Brothers Discovery, is now in our market. It owns three, along with the three now platform, other channels like Bravo, Rush, and Eden as well. And there's also that inc increasing influence of social media, uh, the big, big social media giants um, over our media entities. Yeah, and this is an ongoing existential yeah. issue for the media, it's an old story, but essentially Google and Meta, they've gobbled up a lot of the traditional advertising revenue streams that our media relied on. And at the same time as they've done that, they've also become a vital way for the media to share its content and actually get out to an audience. So you have this self-reinforcing cycle where media organisations are constantly providing <laughs> more chum, more content that props up the social media giants that are kind of actively undermining their business model. Mm. And... While this is happening, we've been propping up the media with stuff like the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Mm -hmm. That's now been cancelled. So all this amounts to the report being pretty bearish, mm. pretty pessimistic on the fi financial future of our media. So that's already manifesting. We've had rounds of layoffs this year in some of our commercial media companies. Uh, TVNZ's profit has slashed mm. markedly. And 2024 is not looking like it will be great for our sector. And look, if you want to look hear more about that and the influence of big tech on our media, then Sunday's episode of Media Watch, Colin interviewed uh, Dr. Murya Mililati, and she's one of the authors of this report as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just briefly uh, do a little tangent here. Um, a couple of texts. As an aspiring journalist, I watch news first and listen to RNZ. I don't like the media being biased and one-sided when it comes to climate change. It's Gary, and I've got a friend who avoids the news, says this next text. Too much death and destruction and life is hard enough. Well, that's a pretty valid point, I would have thought. But uh, there you go. And then another one on Tori Fano. Hi, Mark and Hayden. I just had a quick search of the internet for possibly not real Tori Fano footage. Not that I think I could achieve in one minute what many proper searches couldn't. And I found a link on Reddit. I got Rick rolled. <laughs> Cheers, <Yeah>. AJ. 
Um, oh, and no. he says, P.S. I'm, I'm sorry that happened to you, AJ. I'm looking forward to taking a break from news over summer. I think many people probably are. You know, Rick rolled the old. Uh, what's yeah, we you, we're, the Rick rolled for the for the listeners that don't know is where someone gives you clickbait, pointing you to a video that you want to see, and then it just plays Rick Astley's yeah. "Never Going to Give You Never Up." Gonna give you up. That's the That's one. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to where we were. The report yeah. we're talking about this report from the AUT also delves into what the government has done to prop up public broadcasters. Yeah, it does. And this is the public media section of the show. It's basically, in this area, a story of big ambition, little achievement. Just to recap, the former Labour government, it had big transformative plans for the English and Māori language speaking public broadcasting sectors. It obviously wanted to merge TVNZ and RNZ and that was burnt in the policy bonfire. The Māori media sector as well went through its own convoluted process that led nowhere. Nanaia Mahuta, she launched a review of the Māori media sector in 2018. It recommended, among other things, centralising some news production for Māori language media, and that was criticised by quite a few people in the sector. It was scrapped when Willie Jackson came in as broadcasting minister. So a lot of proposing and scrapping. And remind us, what do we have now in the place of these plans? Basically... The status quo, what we had before, but with some dollars added. So RNZ got a $25.7 million annual funding boost over the next four years. So $25 million a year for four years. Mm. New Zealand On Air funds a lot of TV and TV content. It got $10 million for 2023-24. The Māori media field as well, that got $40 million in both 2022 and 23 and 23-24. The bulk of that went to the Māori media funding body, Te Mangai Pahu, which distributes it around and for Kata Māori. Why does all this, or what does it all mean really for the future of public broadcasting? This is interesting. The, the, when the Labour was proposing these big structural changes, the merger and stuff, it would always say we need this to ensure that public broadcasting is big and strong and malleable enough for the digital age to come, that it's viable in our changing media environment. And instead of those structural changes, we now have just agencies like RNZ and Te Mangai Pahō coming up with their own ideas for how to transform their operations with a few more resources. It's so basically the same entities we've always had have been given some extra cash and told to adapt to the future media market. On their own. Yeah, you. exactly. And there's an argument that maybe that's not such a bad thing. Maybe adaptation to the changing media environment is best left to the organisations actually working in that environment rather than the government. Look, I don't want to be cynical here, Mark, but some people over the years have alluded to the fact that maybe politicians aren't actually that smart and can't actually come up with great plans. Maybe it's better left to the to the experts. And I, and I note that Willie Jackson when he was the broadcasting minister, was pretty optimistic about the potential of this new funding and what we would do with it. So here he is talking to Mihi Ngārangi Forbes on TV show The Hui back in June 2022. Following the Māori media uh, sector review, there's been 40 million bucks uh, over two years in budget 2022, 8 million for strategy and development, 12 million to iwi media, collaboration ideas for um, news and current affairs, and 20 million for content creation. So what can we expect to see with this funding? Well, we're going to see something new, something different. Something new, something different. He didn't right. give any more details than that. I didn't really, you didn't miss much there, but it did sound very exciting to have something new and something different coming. Are we really going to get something new and something different out of the same organisations and the same people that have been there for decades? Yeah, I mean, cases? that's the question. Like places like RNZ, RN, uh, TVNZ, even Fakata Māori, uh, Māori TV, mm. they're structurally born of this pre digital media age. They're not digital native places they're mm. adapting uh will the will their structures still make sense in future will they be able to change enough and there's also that potential problem that the money that labor gave them it could run out it's time limited the incoming government looks a lot less likely to keep topping it up as we potentially head into a recession mm. so uh, what will happen then will we go back to these underfunded public operations set up to cater for a media market from several decades ago you know commercial media is not looking good the bad news is public media is not looking too great either it's a really cheery show tonight yeah, indeed and the new government's going to have quite a big say in how it all shapes up from here on in yeah it's not just the money uh, besides anything else there's stuff that will be scrapped or redone for instance 
Labour designed a charter for the aborted TVNZ RNZ merged entity. It was planning to incorporate some of that public service charter stuff into RNZ and TVNZ. That's possibly not going to happen anymore. It also had proposed a law aimed at getting money out of some tech giants to fund journalism. Nationals indicated that it doesn't support that. But the main thing is the money. As the report says, it's uncertain what will happen in what it calls a straightened economic climate. But I can guess what will happen, and that's that less money will be coming the public sector's way, or the public media sector's way. And the mm-hmm. question is, how much less? Is that $25.7 million a year for RNZ? Is that at risk beyond this current financial year, for instance? So, in the meantime, our public media entities, what are they doing with the money that they have been given already? So the report notes that Tamangai Paho, that Māori media funding body, that's developing a data-driven approach for its funding decisions. So it has a real quantitative case to present to the government to justify its decisions on the impact of the stuff it's funding. So it's also encouraging apparently more collaboration between between Takaridi, Fakata Māori and Watia News. What RNZ is doing with its funding boost, a bit less obvious. Uh, its employees, we know they're trying, as yet unsuccessfully, to get their share of the money. We had a press release issued by the unions E2 and the PSA earlier this week, which confirmed RNZ is locked in a dispute with unionised staff who want a pay increase in line with last year's inflation of 7%. RNZ, on the other hand, has only offered 5.5%. Uh, as for what we're doing... Uh, RNZ structurally investing in new technologies. The details are kind of scant, but there were some that came through from the Herald's Media Insider commentator Shane Curry this week. And he reported on a leaked internal RNZ document which spells out the station's new efforts to target the 30 to 49 year old demographic. So, what did that document, that leaked document, what did it reveal? Well, apparently RNZ is developing a new digital experience targeting 30 to 49-year-olds, which basically appears to be a special mobile app with a new brand name, potentially, anyway. The app concept designed by has been designed by an outside marketing agency. It's apparently targeted somewhere between, this is to quote them, Stuff and Facebook, mm. whatever the heck that means. I don't know where you land when you go between Stuff mm. and Facebook. Mm. Where, what does that look like? Anyway, there are some mock-ups in Curry's story of what the app will look like. It's similar to what you might get on maybe Stuff or the Spinoffs app with a mixture of harder news and lighter fear. I think one of the stories that they mocked up was why is Taylor Swift not stopping in New Zealand? Uh, there's large fonts. It's all snackable content. So it's a bit similar to what you might already get from the commercial media, mm. but with the bonus of there not being ads. So what did uh, what was Shane Curry's opinion of this? It's quite clear from the column mm-hmm. that he is not... A fan at all. And maybe this is where his former role as a high up executive at NZME does shine through a bit. So in his eyes, the plans could this plan could shift audiences away from media outlets like the New Zealand Herald stuff, News Hub One News, the spin off, which are already serving uh, pretty comprehensively that thirty to forty nine year old age range. It's mm. a really well served media market. And that could potentially make it harder for those organizations to stay viable. Uh, in a time when media companies are already facing a pretty tough advertising market and laying people off. That's obviously not appealing to Shane Curry. He also mm. sees it as conflicting with earlier public statements from RNZ and its chief executive, Paul Thompson, who has said, to be fair, that RNZ won't be growing for the sake of it or cannibalising other people's audiences. Thompson, he also told Stuff's Tom Pullis Strecker, that RNZ won't be ploughing resources into areas where the media sector is currently strong and it won't be replicating stuff on the New Zealand Herald. Do you think he has a point? Yeah, Shane, does, yeah, Shane Curry have a point that maybe there's a bit of hypocrisy there. I'm sympathetic, or a bit of <laughs> broken promises there, I guess. I'm sympathetic to the idea that the, the 30 to 49-year-old age group is the most served part of the media market. And... If RNZ really wants to perform its charter and really cater to audiences from the, mm. reflecting the diversity of New Zealand, then there are probably better options to aim at. 
people who have been more poorly served by the broadcaster for a long term time who could claim first place or a higher priority in its list of people to target. Mm. On the other hand, and at the risk of sounding like I'm just defending my home turf here, it does feel like there's a, I, I, there's an edge of entitlement to the idea that RNZ shouldn't encroach or compete with the audiences that other commercial outlets are serving. Mm. Because I think people aged 30 to 49, they pay taxes just like the rest of us. And they can probably expect a return on their tax dollar, right? Mm. In the form of public broadcasting serving them, rather than just public broadcasting serving RNZ's audience, which is, to be honest, I, I love each and every one of you out there, but older and whiter than New Zealand. And there's no reason why they shouldn't get a return on their taxpayer dollar in the form of content catering to them just because people have the option of sus- subscribing to the Herald or stuff instead. Mm, mm. And uh, uh, as well, I just would note that there's no reason to believe that the RNZ content that it puts forward in this app would be uh, not distinguishable or distinctly di- different to that that's served up by NZ, me or any other media company. Mm. Mm. Uh, remember there was the RNZ proposal to, uh, for a youth station that sort of came and went a few years ago. Um, was there a similar attitude from commercial providers to that? Yeah, I think it was a similar vibe at the time. When RNZ proposed this youth station, you had commercial providers, the people representing them, bristling at the idea that the station would be encroaching on their yeah. market and taking their audiences. And again, I think young, pe- young people, they pay taxes just like anyone else, mm-hmm. and they deserve public content targeted at them. They deserve a return on their dollar. One thing I do agree with uh, Curry and others on, though, and that's that there's a, there's a pretty high chance that this new digital venture could be a waste of money, that it might fail. Are you suggesting RNZ doesn't have a great track record with these sorts of new investments? Well, you know, I would say, yes, far t- be it not you. far be it from me to be critical, <laughs> like, but you'd have to say that RNZ has notched up a string of failures for trying to cater to younger audiences over the last few years at least. Mm. There's that aforementioned youth station that was back in 2020. You remember that failed there's concert FM got upset. Chris, yeah, concert FM. Well, all of Concert FM's fans, Helen Clark, Chris Finlayson, everyone in between, got plan- upset about the plans to shift Concert FM off the radio to make room for this new venture. How mm. dare uh, RNZ do that was the cry, and then RNZ uh, didn't dare. It also launched, you might remember this, the wireless website back in 2013. That shut down after five years. It failed to gain a foothold. Other ventures, other efforts to branch out have gone a bit better. It's invested pretty heavily in podcasts. You'd have to say that's paid off. It has some high rating. Uh, it's got a pretty varied suite of offerings as well in that area. There's meaty news and analysis like The Detail, which is a collab with Newsroom, of course, and there's Light Affair like Did the Titanic Sink, which I listened to recently. I really ha- highly recommend that one. Mm-hmm. Uh in general, though, you'd have to say RNZ has a pretty poor track record venturing outside its core audience. And there's not a huge amount in this concept that carry details to make me think it'll draw the target audience away from their existing options. And to be honest, I don't really see why people aged 30 to 49 need a new app separate from the existing RNZ app, which probably needs an overhaul, but mm. could be done without launching a whole new venture. I mean especially given a lot of the content that's mocked up in the Herald article seems like stuff that you might be able to get elsewhere. Anyway, right. 6 to 11 it is. This is RNZ Night and Midweek Media Watch with Hayden Donnell. And another scoop uh, from uh, that uh, Media Insider column. That yeah, Media in. Watch reports the Media <laughs> Insider tonight. Yeah, yeah. Th- uh, Tree, TV3, has found its replacement for the project. Yeah, new new 7pm vehicle will be hosted by the current AM host, Ryan Bridge. And that show has been, his show on AM, uh, his show AM has been competing much more successfully with TVNZ's Breakfast than any of its predecessors on 3. Obviously the channel has decided that Bridge has proved he's got what it takes and he's he's ready for a prime time slot. Yeah, but there were rumours it was going to be Paddy Gower, I think, from memory, isn't it? Yeah, that was the talk of the town. Did yeah. you think it was going to be Gower? Well, it seemed kind of logical. It seemed like they'd done a bit of a test run yeah. of this uh, program. <laughs> More Gower. Yeah, yeah. Hour Gower. of Gower. <laughs> What? <laughs> this is just a lot. I've got some concepts here. Uh, he, he does already have a pretty outsized presence on three. He has the Patrick Gower on 
whatever da, 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 dot yes, yes, series right. has got yeah. Patrick Gower. Paddy Gower has issues that weekly show. Yeah. Perhaps the station thought they're just there's just not enough issues and there's too much Paddy Gower already in the world. Can't sustain a daily show. Yep. So we'll give it to Ryan. And what do you think his program, the Ryan Bridge uh, effect, will have? Yeah, d- like? details scant yeah. at the moment. It's obviously in early days, but Bridge himself, he told Curry that it's going to be live, he's going to be doing interviews. It does feel like it may be a return mm. to a more of a Campbell live style of current affairs, something with a bit more backbone. Uh, that, that, that would be welcome. Mm. It's, a t- it's an idea whose time has come again. Mm. We're going back. We're 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 recycling back to the days of Holmes and Campbell Live, maybe. But Ryan uh, Bridge would have a different worldview than John Campbell, I would have thought. I suspect he might have a slightly different outlook on life mm-hmm. to John. And I'll note that the spin-off Duncan Grieve also sees a bit of a change of strategy of sorts for three in this move. So Bridge is seen as right of centre. He was a host on Magic Talk. He's espoused some conservative opinions on AM. Grief says that's become a bit of an outlier in the land of primetime TV, and he wonders whether bringing in Bridge is partly a strategic move to win over more right-leaning audiences, or at least target a different demographic than other TV shows. I'm personally a believer in a, a media that has diverse perspectives within it, and I think when you have a television sector that broadly either has centrist people or left-leaning people, that is part of what creates this general kind of grumpy uh, disposition towards the media because, let's face it, 55% of people just voted for the three parties that are in government now and a lot of those people don't feel represent that, that their views are regularly represented on television. That's, that's Duncan Grieve on the spin-offs podcast The Fold. Mm, but that sort of approach also has risks, doesn't it, if a host gets a, a bit too political? Perhaps, right? TVNZ did eventually get tired of Mike Hosking after maybe one controversial uh, Mike's Minute, or there wasn't Mike's <laughs> Minute back then, there was a, one editorial too many, but Bridge, at least of late, I, had to, I haven't noticed him being a massive firebrand of, mm. of late. He is relatively fair in interviews, and for three, it's obviously assessed that the risk is worth taking given the lagging behind TVNZ and the ratings in general at the moment. There's also the fact that this will this will just be a lot cheaper than paying for the licensing rights to the project mm. format, which was developed by Rove over in Australia. You Indeed. pay for that one. Yeah, and the cast of thousands. Now, a new venture is launching. Uh, you wanted to talk about a station that's actually shutting down. Yeah, before we go, Hamish McNeely at Stuff broke the news today that Channel 39 in Dunedin is closing its, its doors by Christmas. It spent decades on air. And it provided video news from the South. It had a news bulletin, The South Today, which was made with the backing of Allied Press and its newsroom resources. It was a pretty slick operation Mm. by all accounts. Actually, the producer of this show, Nights, worked on Channel 39, I understand. Mm. Anyway, the the station also made international headlines for its student-centred show, Cow TV. Have you seen clips of that? It it featured uh, the Crowd Goes Wild host, Andrew Mulligan, future (laughs) Prime Ministerial partner, Clark Gayford, both in their younger days, obviously. So why is it going? Money, is it? Potentially money. It's not completely clear, but it seems this may be a casualty of the Public Interest Journalism Fund drying up. So it received nearly $700,000 in the last couple of years when the fund was operational, but that dipped to four hundred and fifty k this year under the old New Zealand on Air system. Mm. Uh, maybe that's that's for a whole year. Maybe that just leaves them a bit thin. It's a bit too much, uh, too much to do it with just that level of funding. And the long and short of it, though, is that it leaves us with less news again from the south, where major media companies are already relatively thin on the ground. Righty ho. Well, there we go. That's our look at the media midweek wise. Thank you, Hayden, as always. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. We look forward to the final show uh, next week. Yeah, is it next week? That There'll be a, week. A, a year end, a wrap of the yeah. year. That well, we... that's what we're going to do, I think. Aren't we? We... I don't know if you want to spoil what we're doing. Okay. Don't, yeah. don't, should I? Should I? Well, it sort of seems kind of obvious. We might do some awards. Do so. <laughs> or is there going to be awards? There's going to be awards. So didn't you I, not know? You're presenting know them, Mark. <laughs> For goodness sake, Mark, it's somebody all needs to, to me. inform you of stuff. <laughs> it's all spontaneous in my book. Here we go.